What's up, guys? We're back again with a brand new sound advice. I'm here with Justin, High Five Vega, and you may notice someone is missing, and that's our key guest. I don't, I don't know where he is. Where, where is he? Oh, he's probably doing his other show. Oh yeah, that's probably yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's going to be on a little bit after Daily High Five ends. He's going to go ahead and jump on there. So don't worry about that he'll be joining us about 15 or 20 minutes or so and, but before that we're going to be go ahead and, and just talk about measurements life in general and everything else justin how you doing man i'm doing all right i'm doing all right i've got my measurement microphone right here behind me i'm all set to, i'm all set oh. for the show so i've even brought the i brought the props for the show shoot i don't even think i have my props near me i have them somewhere Oh, there I it will is. say my, my room looks very weird green. Boom. It, we barely yeah. missed St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, After daylight savings time, my space gets washed out with light. And so I used to have a kind of a darker background. It looked better. But now this window back here is killing my, my vibe. This is this is my measurement microphone. You'd never want to drop these, by the way, because <laughs> they're uh, my first Omni mic. Actually, my my kids knocked over. And, uh, well, actually it was just my son, my son, Jeremiah knocked it over and it was, it was a goner. It was a goner, but you know what? It is what it is. So you guys have done some measurements, done some things, and that's basically what we're going to be talking about today. Now you just used the UMIC one. Is that right? I think so. I think it's the UMIC one. Yes. Yeah, so it has a mini DSP name on the side of the box. So I think that's the one. Now, which one did you get? Where'd you get it from? I'm pretty sure I got it from parts express. Okay, because they have those ones, and then they also have a, a calibrated version that you know goes through more calibration, supposedly that makes it even better. And I don't know. I I've never listened to one of those. I do know sometimes the Omni or the Omni mic, the Mini DSP response isn't always one hundred percent accurate, but it usually can get you in the ballpark, and you could be. I mean, for the price it is, you can't go wrong with it. Well, this one this one came with a calibration file. Uh, you know, I've, I've used it, I think, all of once. You know, I, oh, I'm going to buy this cool thing. And then I tried it once and was like, well, that didn't look good on film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a boring exciting. video. <laughs> I got I guess, the Dayton UMM6. Have you used that one? No, that's the tiny one, right? No, no, that's the IMM6. This oh, is the, it's the USB. USB version. You know, they have one that, that requires the phantom power. Yes, uh, the, but this, the, and I can't remember the model number of that one. Hey guys, real quick, Scott from Powerhog Audio gave us a five dollar super chat. Thanks, guys. We really appreciate that. Anyone else that wants to give super chats, you're always welcome to. We always appreciate those. Aaron's in, so let's go ahead and add him to the screen, guys. If you haven't got to check out Powerhog Audio, go check them out. They are brand new um, to the car audio industry. We wish them the best of luck. But let's go ahead and get Aaron on. There he is. What's up, Aaron? <laughs> You're live. Hey, oh, he, how's it he going? Memo. Hey, get the, the green light memo. There he is. What's up, Aaron? Oh man, it's it's, it's going well. I think I've got a little got bit of delay. window open somewhere, and it's playing in the background. Yes, yes, got it. All right, cool. I was trying to bring <laughs> up the, the chat thing because I was like, "What the heck is going on?" Anyway, hey, I appreciate you guys inviting me. This is uh this will be fun. I've I've been a uh, a long time fan of some of y'all, so this will be good. Well, good. Yep. We're excited. And I say some. I'm specifically talking about not Rob. <laughs> yeah. Well, we all we all know the truth here. Uh, we we became best friends down in Sqology. We did. We we and, hung and out. And everybody else shed me. We we held hands briefly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, you know what you guys do in your off time? It's up to you. You know that's up to yeah, you. Hey, yeah. you know, take it any way you can get it these days, especially that's when right. you're married. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Scott did say uh, the website for Powerhog Audio goes live after the show. So if you guys want to check that out, you should check it out. Scott, if you want to throw that link in the chat, that'd be nice for people that, that want to know that. Well, Aaron, man, we are so excited to have you on here. I know I, in particular, am very excited about what you're doing over there. You bought the Clipple. I mean, I don't know how many thousands yeah. of dollars it costs you. We don't need it's a lot though. And yeah, I'm super super excited about this the research and stuff that you're doing over there. Well, I appreciate it, man. Yeah, I'm having fun with it. Yeah. Well why don't you do you mind telling us a little bit about why you yeah why you got no, the clip 
That's yeah. fine. Um, I guess just like, because I'm sure a lot of people don't know me. Uh, my background is I've been into car audio for maybe about 15 or so years. I uh, got really heavy into it about 12 or so, maybe 13 or so years ago. And then I started, you know, kind of getting into the science side of things like, you know, how does this work? How do you tune? How do speakers work? Uh, what makes a good speaker? All this kind of stuff. So I started testing for DIY mobile audio around 2010 or 2011. Uh, did some testing for them. Basically, when I did the testing for them, they owned a Clipple and then mm. they loaned it out to me, allowed me to do the testing as long as I post on their website. Uh, the owner at the time, I posted a couple reviews and he didn't like them because he had connections with some of the manufacturers. And so the honesty of the data kind of caught up with, I won't say me, but him. And he didn't like that. So he, I don't know, we parted ways. I'll just put it that way. And then I started testing on my own. I reached out to Clipple and got some stuff from them and I uh, had to take a hiatus from testing drive units for a while because, you know, we had some health issues with my daughter and got that squared away a couple of years ago. Uh, and then last year I was like, I really kind of miss testing. I'd like to do testing again, but I would like to get into testing loudspeakers instead of just drivers. So now I do loudspeakers and drive units and that's pretty much where it's at for me. And I just enjoy doing it, man. I think there's a, there's a lot of good information that could be shared. Um, so I'm happy to do it because I don't know. I just enjoy the science of it. I, I enjoy music first. That's where my love is. But I want to try to understand, you know, how we can get better sound and relay to relay that to everybody. So that's pretty much it. That's my whole spiel in a nutshell. Yeah. And I think that's so important because I people don't seem to understand that measurements can tell you a lot about not only how a speaker sounds, but how good a speaker actually is. Right. Uh, and I'm sure you've you've come across that. You know, I bet you've probably had some speakers on there that didn't sound great and then you were able to measure it and see you know what was absolutely. going on yeah yeah absolutely and through like car audio competitions the sound quality side you know you, you compete for a while and you kind of get used to then you start judging and you start to be able to pick up on hey this frequency means this or you know if it's got a bloated or bloated a bloated bass then it's probably <laughs> this range 50 to 100 hertz or if it's shrill or something like that then it's probably in the you know it could be anywhere it could be one to four k but it depends on you know the frequency that you think you're hearing but you get better basically more refined at being able to identify the frequency specifically. So when you are able to audition a speaker and then go and measure it, usually what you hear lines up pretty darn well with what you measure. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, on my channel, I teach a lot about crossover design and, and I have a forum where people start doing that. And one of the, the key things that I find a lot of people doing is they're going for that flat frequency response, which is, which is good. Mm -hmm. But what you'll find out is that they're crossing over way too too far down in the spectrum or, oh, or yeah, way, too high, yeah. way too high where you were going to have all these problems with, you know, either dispersion or distortion or, or something where that's going to become really problematic. Right. Uh, um, and I think that's part of the area in at least the DIY world where, uh, where sometimes people are, are lacking or, or missing that knowledge, that mm -hmm. second step of the aspect of that design. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, and even car audio, you know, like I think the biggest, thing oh, that I'm I learned sorry. was, um, <laughs> now we'll, we can get to that in a minute. Actually, it's really great. I'll go ahead and get to that. Uh, it can be, but I'm a guy. I used to be a girl, but I've had the surgery recently. Uh, third grade was really tough because it was spelled with an E and they're like, it's a girl's name. And I'm like, you want to fight? And they all beat me up. And it was mainly girls who beat me up. <laughs> um, but my mom says to tell everybody that it's part of my Irish heritage. And that's why I say it fits because you guys got the green backgrounds. Um, yeah. so that's the Aaron is a girl. We, we did that on purpose. Yeah. yeah. So here that we was go. deliberate. <laughs> now I'm matching. So I, like I actually it. was not trying to show that. Sorry. I, that was an, a mistake, <laughs> but no, I mean, no, you, that's you can fine. get into dude, it if you want to. Dude. No, I mean, I've been dealing with that my entire life. I mean, it's a joke. I always make a joke. So anyway, um, yeah, I think like the car audio stuff taught me a long time ago that if you just know the simple equation for beaming, which is speed of sound, uh, divided by the diameter of the speaker and then just half that, then that's going to be approximately the beaming point for whatever speaker you're talking about, driving it you're talking about. So if you get that down, everything else is pretty much gravy from there, you know, like a six and a half inch woofer beam somewhere like, I don't know the exact number, but it's like, let's just say 1500 Hertz. So you don't want to cross a six and a half inch woofer over at four kilohertz because it mates better with your tweeter. That's a bad idea because then the directivity is uh, shrinking, becoming more narrow, and your tweeter is omni, so you've got a big mismatch in directivity at the crossover region. And you've got issues that uh, you can't fix with an EQ because the problem is in the uh, crossover itself. So, you know, yeah. that's one of those things. I've got a um, 
I, I put a three-way system in my truck. I've never been to a sound quality contest. I'm pretty sure to your ears, it would sound like garbage, uh, but I enjoyed well, but I enjoyed putting it together. I, I yeah. did it because I wanted the challenge of trying to take everything apart, put it all together. And um, the beauty of a three-way system like that is you don't have to worry about beaming. You can, you can cross things over so you don't have to worry about beaming. Right. But then right. you've got all the other trouble that pops up when you have three different drivers on each side of the speaker. Yeah. You know, are these damn things even pointed in the right direction when you get in a car? <laughs> <laughs> I just turn them all facing the other way. And that way I have an excuse. Like if it sounds bad and somebody says your car sounds like junk, I'd be like, well, dude, I mean, the speakers are facing the wrong way. What are you expecting? Yeah. Hey, just, I was, just DSP it out a little bit, man. It's yeah. Just, DSP will fix everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hey, don't and, worry you know, about you that distortion. About it, you're good. Like the, the simplest of things. Um, well, the first time I saw one of those polarity testers on five star car stereo, I thought, that's the stupidest thing. Why would anyone pay 10 bucks <laughs> for that? And then one day I bought one. Yeah. And and it turns out that well, there was a reason those things didn't quite sound right because I had my speakers out of phase. I crossed a wire somewhere in the install. Yeah. And uh and when I was able to flip them in the DSP, just like it came to life. It was like, oh, this sucks. I can't believe it. And then I flip them in the DSP and it's all like, oh hey, it doesn't <laughs> suck. This is halfway <laughs> decent. Dude, I can't tell you the number of times I've done something like that or or like been tuning my car, you know, and, and mute like the entire right side because I want to focus on just <laughs> lining up the left side. And then I'll unmute everything, but forget to unmute like the mid bass or something. And I don't realize it until I've already gone to a show because when I compete, normally I don't listen to my stereo before I'm driving to a show. Not because I'm scared I'm going to mess something up, but because I know me, I'm like, if I find something wrong, I want to pull over the side of the road and try to fix it immediately. And I don't want to do that. So I just listen to like podcasts or something, but then I'll go to a show and they'll say, yeah, man, you know, your, your subwoofers didn't sound right. And it turns out I have my subwoofer still turned off or something like that. <laughs> like, oh, crap. Never mind. That's, you know, that's pretty good when they don't sound right when they're totally off. It's yeah, like, that, you, you know, know what? Yeah. I'll take that. I'll I mean, that. you've done a pretty good job with the yeah. rest of the system. If they're <laughs> off and the system still sounds yeah. just just not right as opposed to tell, totally yeah. wrong. That's right. That's right. Oh, man. Well, so I do you guys. That, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you go ahead, Aaron. You I do was going to say, do you, so Justin doesn't compete car audio. I, I know Rob doesn't do sound quality. I don't know if have you done. Um, competition to car audio i'm just curious yeah no. i i started yeah. off as a bass head so yeah spl um up until about 2002 was the very last one i done and you know i was actually into sound quality at that point but to me sound quality was so scary to try to compete because it's you know if you don't understand sound quality it's like it's like magic to you yeah and uh, <laughs> and and spl is about the numbers so i know no matter yeah. who's listening to this car, I get these numbers. They can't say that I didn't get these numbers. So it's just, it's a solid fact and it's easier that way. But once you start to understand sound quality and start to understand what they're looking for, tonality, imaging, um, sound stage, that type of stuff, mm -hmm. then you can see, okay, it's not as subjective as you might think from the outside if you've never actually took a deep dive into it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's a good point. It's interesting when you talk about that, too, because I, I think you're absolutely right with sound quality. And I think part of the issue is, too, a lot of people haven't ever really heard great sound quality either. Mm -hmm. And so it's very hard for them to judge what's great sound quality if they've never heard it. Right. Yeah, that's true. At home and car audio, that's both. That's oh, why yeah. I'm like I'm, I'm a proponent of getting out there. You know, if, if there's a car audio, not even just a competition, but just a meet. If you can get out to an event or something just to hang out with people and kind of listen to somebody's car. And then if you like what they've done, then you can talk to them about it. And same thing for home audio. You know, if you can have the opportunity to, to pick somebody's brain who you feel like is doing the right things, then you can learn that way. Oh, I think you're right. Um, people, you know, when, when I build my speakers, for example, one of the things that I do is I always test my speaker mono before I, I do anything with the second one, because I think you can hear a lot more of what's mm -hmm. going on with the speaker by itself then you can stereo. And I was really excited because I think it was a few weeks ago. I was listening to a mirror, I think from mm -hmm. uh, audio, audio, uh, what is it? Audio sound audio research science review. Audio science review. Yeah, That's it. Yeah. yeah. From, I don't know. I'm like ASR. What's the stand for? ASR. <laughs> yes. <Hazard>. Yeah. <laughs> audio science review. I was listening to him and he said that was the same thing they taught at Harmon, which I thought was pretty cool that, that yeah. they do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That is, I, I'm with you there too. So like when I do, when I do my reviews, I always listen to the speaker first before I measure, because if I measure, I will be biased by what I've seen in the measurements. Even if, 
you know, yeah. it's, if it's unless it's been like a few weeks and I've seriously just forgotten because I have a hard time remembering a lot of things um, like forgot what I ate for lunch yesterday. <laughs> Actually, it was yesterday. Yeah, yesterday was Sunday. So I, I was going to say I don't even think yesterday was Sunday. Um, anyway, um, yeah, I always listen before I do the measurements for that reason. And I do measurements or I, I listen in mono, but I also listen in stereo because I feel like in mono, it's easier to tell where there's a discrepancy in the crossover region. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the stereo, that really gives you the stereo effect, you know. So I like to do both. But I think yeah. Amir only does mono and I don't I feel like you're kind of missing some stuff when you only do mono as well. Oh, absolutely. No, I like to do it when I'm designing a crossover because I feel like you can start to see where the problem area, you can really hear the problem areas. Yeah. Um, even if it's not necessarily coming up with the distortion measurement or you're, you're not really seeing it necessarily on the measurement, you can still hear it. And mm -hmm. um, that happened a lot. My JBL soundstage, I could tell something was off in the one kilohertz region. I'm like, there's something there. Right. Uh, just change something around. And I, but I don't know that it would hurt it in, in stereo. I really don't. Yeah, I think like for me, it's just it's just easier to tell stuff like that in mono. You know, I, I guess you feel like you're not trying to listen through everything, yeah. you know, to listen to the tonality effects. But the biggest thing for me is just being able to use like a like a mini DSP or any sort of DSP mm. and and sit there in front of it and then make changes on the fly, you know, with an active system and then say, OK, yeah, I like that change. Now, how can I build that passively? You know, that's a great idea. Yeah. Well, and that's you know, it for me. Then I'm out. Yeah. I get one per week. I start on Monday. I'm gonna have to <laughs> have to ration that out the rest of this week. But, you know, the crazy thing about measurements is you can get yourself to a certain point with measurements, but then to go the next level, there's a little something extra, especially in cars, that yeah. you need because you can be a perfect, you know, harm and curve, yeah. you know, and still be just a little bit off. So it is. There is a little bit of magic in, in SQ and cars anyways. I don't know oh, absolutely. How, how it works in, in home. but Yeah, I think home and car, I mean, well, they are two totally different things. I think nobody's figured out car audio yet. I mean, like to the truest sense, like a Harman, they're all their research is done in the home. So they've got things like mapped out to uh, early reflections and late reflections and direct sound and, you know, reflections off the, the back wall, the front wall, the side walls, top, bottom, all that stuff. In a car, you don't have any of that stuff. And then you're talking about like directivity. So like if you talk about a speaker that has a narrow direct directivity and the high frequencies versus wide, well, we kind of have an idea of what that's going to do in a home, especially if you, you can tell somebody like how wide, you know, where the position of the speakers are in the room um, and then how far the walls are from that speaker. You can say, okay, well, it's got a 70 degree radiation pattern plus or minus. So you're definitely going to catch some of this frequency off the side wall, uh, maybe not this frequency or something like that. But in a car, there is no sidewall. The car is a sidewall, right? Um, yeah. Everything is a baffle in the car, at least up until probably 5K or so. Um, and then, so then you got to figure out like, okay, how is the directivity of this tweeter that I've chosen going to play into this room? You know, is there going to be any sidewall bounce or, or side glass bounce from this aiming? And, and it's just, I don't know, dude, if you try to think about it like scientifically and objective, I don't know if we can ever actually get there all the way. Like, I don't think there's ever going to be a single curve, one size curve fits all because everybody likes a little bit different. Um, and then speakers always behave a little bit differently in terms of the radiation pattern. You know, a one inch dome tweeter is going to beam at like six or seven kilohertz. Uh, if you use a half inch dome tweeter, you're up to like 12 or 13 kilohertz. Uh, if you use just a straight up wide band, you're probably talking four kilohertz. So, I mean, it, it's just, it's all over the place in car audio, man. That's why it's so dang tough. Yeah. You're tuning from inside the enclosure. You are man. Yeah. And that, this is a good um, question because I actually don't know how are sound quality competitions judged? Are they judged on points? Or they yeah, they they have a like a score sheet, um, and it depends on which organization. And I don't know them intimately. Uh, I just I'm familiar with them enough because I've done enough of them. But um, they'll have like tonality, and they'll break it down into sub bass, mid bass, mid range, and highs. Um, and they'll say you know it's like a one out of ten, and we'll give you this score. Or then they have realism and naturalness and. Uh, imaging left, center, right, and what's between those points in space. And it's just, it's that. So they try to make it objective, but it's always going to be subjective to some. And when you degree. say objective, though, is are they taking actual measurements or the, is it no, based no. on their hearing? So it's it is, all I mean, based it's, on hearing. So yeah. It is still a subjective. No, absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Like they try to make it objective, but it's still subjective. Even, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. 
Yeah. I, I think until not... you get an engineer in there that has, that listens to the CD that he spent 30 hours that one, that day before, you know, mixing and mastering until you get him to sit down in the car and play his music. I don't think anybody's, I'm never going to have full 100% trust and believing that, you know, <clears throat> this dude is 100% accurate. I may believe that he's like 90%, but that may only go as far as, you know, how much I agree with him based on my own assessment. And maybe I'm wrong. So how do you know? You know, it's um, it's easy to think that this is a, a, an, a car and home audio problem, that you have a judge who's going to listen and they're going to give you, a you know, an assessment, a score, whatever the case may be. Right. But it's like that everywhere. Uh, you get yeah. outside of audio um, uh, in, in the food industry when they do taste testing. They, they train people. You've seen the movie Napoleon Dynamite where the FFA <laughs> kids were testing the milk. That's a real thing, y'all. They actually do that, and they train people, okay, here's some milk that we've done something to so that it tastes nasty. See if you can taste it. And just like just like with audio, how some people seem to have golden ears, there are people who are hyper testers, or hyper tasters that can wow. taste things that other people can't. Yeah, there was a, a lady on one of those food shows that actually has her taste buds insured. I don't know how that happens. Wow. Yeah. I don't so know Aaron, if I are you going to insure your eardrums? Are you going to no, <laughs> so you can no, judge no. his content? I don't, I don't think that anybody would insure those things. No. <laughs> All right. So I got a question for you, Aaron. So this is how most people test TS parameters, which is yeah. date and audio DATS V3, which yeah. there's nothing wrong with this. Yeah, I've got um, one around here somewhere behind me. Yeah. Yeah. Most people have either this or DATS V2 or something. And I think it's a great. Yeah, Great. I love that. I think it's an invaluable tool for everybody to have. That's why I try to tell everyone. Everyone's yeah, always no, like, that's... it's 130 bucks. It's like, that's the best 130 Dude. bucks you're going to spend in DIY audio. That and REW and a mini DSP mic or a Dayton USB mic are like the three things you have to have if you're building a speaker. I mean, bottom line, have to have. Yeah. Or even if you want to, even if they want to do something like what you're doing mm -hmm. on some type of scientific, but part of the problem with DATS is DATS takes low level TS parameters, right? Right, right. And the clipple allows you to take full level, right? So does it allow you to take both low and high? I can do whatever voltage I want going out to it. Yeah, yeah. And what and what a lot of people don't realize with speakers is, or drivers in general, which make up the speakers, is that mm -hmm. those TS parameters can change yeah. based on the amount of power you give it, correct? Yep. yep, absolutely. Yeah. And just the temperature. I mean, if you take it from, if you go out into your garage and it's, 80 degrees and you know one day and then you have a cold front move in the next couple of days and you go out in your garage and it's 30 or 40 degrees then that will affect the vast and the bl and the sensitivity spec so yeah i mean even temperature alone that's why when i when i do my ts testing i actually do it in here that's the clipple stand that i mount the drivers to and i do it in this office so that way the room is always you know around the same temperature you know within maybe a five degree window or something yeah no that's that's smart to do how much does elevation affect that? Um, it will get above sea level. Yeah, honestly, I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I don't know if it would really matter, but I really don't know. I think the main thing really is just temperature and the, and the signal, you know, like Nick is saying, because like if you do like a just a, a simple sound sweep, that's different than doing like a multi-tone stimulus, uh, which is what the Clipple does. It does like a multi-tone stimulus and it extracts the TS out of it or if I'm doing it for just a loudspeaker, it will do a uh, sound sweep through it, you know, so you can get different results depending on the voltage level and the signal that you put through it. Uh, you can do averaging with the clipple, you know, in real time. So it's just, it just depends. And dude, even like uh, somebody asked me this actually on, on one of my YouTube videos today. Um, and I replied back and this is, this is the funny thing. Like even the amount of force that you put on the screws that you use to mount the speaker or the driver to the box can change the impedance curve. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, like if you back the screws out all almost all the way, just enough to where the speaker is just kind of sitting there, you can sweep it and get a different result than if you tighten the speaker all the way down. I've done it numerous times, and it's a trip. So real <laughs> quick, uh, Brian, that's not correct. So he said TS parameters are definition small parameters. Well, that I guess that's that is correct to a degree. Deal small parameters. Yeah. A lot of people. <clears throat> uh, what I wanted to say is I misread that. I thought you said small was the guy's. Is actually the guy's name. It doesn't actually stand for small parameters which i think a lot of people get confused they think it stands for thiel and then small parameters which is not what that it's means small yeah thiel and then it's like small parameters but small is is the guy it's richard small i yeah. think richard small yeah uh, well i think his whole name is actually it's just his first two initials are ts and his last name is parameters so but the reason why thiel small parameters changing with uh Deal small parameters changing based off of the amount of power 
you get, get give it can be problematic is based on how you design the speaker. If you design the speaker for low power and the Thiel small parameters change significantly when you give it a large power and you're trying to put it in a larger room, it can actually change the tuning frequency of, of the driver in this. Yes, actually, you know, if I can try to pull up an example of that I've done. So with the clipple, you, you can, you initially start off with a small signal test and then you feed those inputs into another module with the clipple. And then the clipple will test at uh, large power, you know, intervals. And you can actually create the curve of like the stroke, the BL over the excursion. Uh, but you can also plot, the FS. So you can actually see the FS change, the QT change. You can see those electrical parameters change with excursion. And it's kind of neat with some very bad designs. You can see the FS shift as much as 20 Hertz, you know, yeah, within, it, it a, can be, within a few millimeters. And that's, that's huge. <clears throat> yeah, that's huge. For the most part, I think most of the ones that I've seen, I would say, pro I mean, I'm just ballparking off of memory. I would say probably within, you know, the typical operating range, you're probably looking at about like maybe five or six Hertz, you know, which isn't a whole lot. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if that's typical, you know, I mean, if that's acceptable or if that's outside of a ballpark of reason, but I would think that's reasonable, you know, but the 20 Hertz is that's a different ball game altogether. Cause then your entire tuning changes completely. Yeah. And, and that's not necessarily, uh, and that's what I'm going to say. I'm not sure if it's typical or not either, but that's what I think is really cool about you being able to test at those higher frequencies, I'm sorry, at those higher power range, because you can tell. Yeah. Hey, is yeah. it actually making that change or not? It's really neat, man. I don't know. That's, that's when you know you're a nerd because you're like, oh, yeah, but I can see the curve of the FS. And people are like, <laughs> what, what are you talking about, you loser? Shut up. <laughs> no, but it, it makes a lot of sense because then you can actually tell someone, hey, look, this speaker would be fine if you're listening to it at low levels. But if you really want to crank this thing up, I probably wouldn't recommend it. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Um right. You know, in car audio, the, these guys, they get a little, uh, if they have a four-ohm driver, two-ohm driver, one-ohm driver, they're like, well, I'm going to wire this amp to one-half ohm. Okay. But as soon as you start playing music, guess what, bro? <laughs> you could be up to eight ohms at, at some yeah. point. Yeah, that's true, man. Yeah. Other, the other way around, too. I mean, if the voice yeah. calls start heating up enough, then you could change the, the tuning there as well. You can go. I yeah, seen all people who want to do that, that are the kind of people who are willing to risk damaging equipment to get a trophy. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's what you want to do. That's fine. But I'd, I'd kind of keep my equipment for the next day. That would be I'm nice. That would Full be sand, man. Full send. Who cares? I'll buy more. <laughs> Full it's, it's America. <laughs> yeah. If you win, you'll buy more. If you win. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you don't, you may not be buying more. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's why I enjoy, you know, testing the drive units as well. But after a while, you, you kind of get tired of seeing the same, you know, the, like everybody's, you know, test a six and a half inch mid base. And I'm like, man, they're kind of like, I've tested 30 of them at this point. They're, they're all the same. <laughs> like, you know, if it's, yeah. if it, if it's cheap in price, it's probably not going to have a lot of excursion. And if it's not, then it probably will have a lot of excursion, you know, and that's general, generality speaking, but I don't know, but there are a lot of really great speakers that are, that are budget minded too. So yeah. Have you, have you tested one that really surprised you that measured really well, like a, a extremely cheap speaker or even just cheap in general? I, I know I have, but I can't think of any that are coming to mind right now, but I know I've certainly run into cases like that where I thought, well, that's better than I expected. And I know um, for certain that you've, you've tested expensive uh, drivers that didn't measure well at all. Yeah, I have done that. Yeah, actually. <laughs> yeah. I've tested some, I think the, um, uh, Audio development was one I got maybe last fall. And I don't remember what the price is, but those are, I want to say like seven, 800, 900 a pair for eight inch mid bass. And they're, yeah. I'm like, really? This is it? This is like a hundred, $150 performance. So right. you see, that's what I want to know. I want to know where is that, uh, where's that diamond in the rough? Where's that speaker that, hey, there's no way this can sound good at that price. And then it turns out to be the best thing out there at any price. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know if you guys, um, I'm sure you probably do, but what is the, um, oh, I'm just drawing a blank right now. It's one of the high five, it's a, it's a driver website. They also sell stuff, but they test. Mattis Sound? Or no. Uh, gosh, I'll remember. I blank on these up. all the same. Yeah, I blank on these the same way whenever I'm on the show. It's like, there's that speaker that I put in my car door. I forget what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I think it's, okay. like a, it's like a Kenwood sound or something like that. Yeah, I think it's made yeah. by Pioneer Alpine, that company. 
Well, you know, I, test, I'll remember it later. I'm testing sure. Testing all these speakers, man. I, I'm. I know that you get some hate because people have affiliations with these companies where they, oh, yeah. they want to justify their purchase, which is just natural. I mean, yeah. if you've spent nine hundred dollars on a pair of mid bass, and right. someone's like, "Hey, these mid bass aren't that great," you feel like a like it's a personal attack. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> I've seen that. Uh, but but surprisingly, it's not as bad in the like the driver world uh, as it is in the the home audio, the speaker world. Because like Klitsch, I tested the Heresy fours, oh. and like, dude, if you upset the Klitsch community, they're coming for you. <laughs> He's off so, of his head type stuff. Yeah, we actually talked about Klipsch in, in our uh, – we've talked about Klipsch in, in a couple of our videos. But one of the things that I don't like about Klipsch most of the time is that they really over-exaggerate their efficiency number almost all of their speakers. Yeah, just take oh. off 6 dB. Whatever they say, take off 6 dB. Yeah, they, they like try to fig figure out what the biggest point is, <laughs> you know, yeah. peak is. And they're like, all right, that's our efficiency. No, that's not your efficiency. Yeah. What, what, that, yeah. So, guys, they're, somebody they're, in the chat mentioned this. We are getting an echo. More than likely, someone's got another browser window open playing this because we can't we can't type into the chat. And so, in order to type in the chat, you got to have a second window open. And so, if you're hearing an echo, that's probably the source. Actually, I don't do that because I can't handle two windows at once. So, um, yeah, I think all the mine are closed already. But yeah, they can let us know if they keep hearing it. The only other one I've got is a DBX YouTube video, and that's one's not even playing. So, unless people want to hear about DBX filters, <laughs> uh, uh, you never know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Think, that I is think Klipsch, uh, they may be trying to turn themselves into the new bows. Um, yes. With their, you know, they're kind of ubiquitous and they're a big name in audio now. And I think they're going farther away from the hardcore. I'm already fired, Deviant. Hardcore, <laughs> um, <laughs> number driven, you know, performance driven. They're just trying to go for the maybe the psychoacoustics. Yeah, I think a lot that. of it is like so. Based on the feedback that I got from the majority of people who didn't like my results, um, this is a generality, okay? But I I would say that it's the majority of clips like diehard fans are fifty plus white males. Um, and that's, you know, and I think a lot of them probably have hearing loss. And that's, then it's, I know that sounds like I'm being mean. That is not me being mean. That's me being serious because Clips generally has that high frequency boost. And a lot of these guys seem to really like that sound. And I, I'm just kind of putting two and two together, you know? Yeah. That's probably it, what's, what's wrong yeah. with me, too. Because I always, you know, I don't, I do like the, the roll off of the tweet, but I always run my tweet a little bit higher than, than most people. Well, when you say a little bit, is a little bit like one dB or like twenty? Because no, no, no. <laughs> like, like instead of a three dB roll off or a six dB roll off, it's more like a one dB roll off. Oh, that's yeah, that's not bad. All and right, so Aaron, I got a question for you. All right, okay. Uh -oh. Here's the deal. I'm scared. <laughs> no. Well, you should be terrified. <laughs> um, have you reviewed any Bose equipment? And, and here's the reason why. I know for a long time. Bose used to like come after anyone that would show their measurements. Like they, they didn't want their measurements published. They didn't want them shown. Uh, I mean, it was, it was a big deal. I don't know if that's still a thing or what. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it is with current Bose products, but I did test the 901 series five, which is there. Like if mm. you know a Bose, you probably know the 901. And that's, that's something I really wanted to test to see how it performed, like what the data looked like. But I also wanted the chance to have to, you know, the chance to hear it myself. Uh, so I tested that one. A lot of people actually said, watch out, they're going to come for you. But that's been discontinued, I think, for five or six years now. I think when I was trying to do my research, they quit making the 901s in like 2016, I think. Okay. Yeah. How did it do? Um, well, so have you heard them before? Have you heard the 901s? I have. I mean, not a lot. I mean, I, I think I visited You're someone's kind of house who had it? some. Yeah. So the thing that I, I think it's a double-edged sword. I understand why people like them. I understand why people hate them. Uh, in terms of accuracy, they're the furthest thing from an accurate speaker I think you know anybody could ever buy. But in terms of what it does, like the soundstage, it, it throws – so it's got one speaker on the front that's a four-inch full range, and then it's got eight four-inch full ranges on the back, and you're supposed to mount it in the corner or put it like close to a rear wall so it fires all that and scatters the sound everywhere off that back wall and or the front wall, I guess. And that's what it does. So it creates a very diffuse soundstage. So you may have a singer that's supposed to be in the center, but they're like left of center and right of singer at the exact same time. And they're huge. 
but it's a trip. Like to me, I was like, this is a really neat effect. So I even said, I think in the review that if I were one of these, like, you know, people flush with money that I would probably have, you know, a room that has not a Bose 901, but then also have a Bose 901 just for the heck of it, you know, just cause it's so neat in a way. Now, did that version of the, there's there's been plenty of versions of the 901. Did that series have a separate EQ? Some of them came with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a, it had an EQ module, like an EQ yeah. box module, with it. And uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know which all of them had it, but I know that that series, the five and the six, are basically the same, except for I think colorways or something like it's just cosmetic. Okay. Um, but it did. It had an EQ box for it. And I've had a couple people ask me, like in you know, comment on the video, and I posted that like last summer. And even as recently as last week, somebody had replied and said, do you need the EQ box? Because I bought these used and I don't have the EQ box. And it turns yeah. out that there's some company, which I can't remember the name of, but they bought mini DSPs and they're loading the mini DSPs with the Bose EQ curves into it. So you that's actually buy, really good. Because that's a good idea. Yeah, you can't find those. The EQs you can't find. And you find a lot of 901s without EQs, I feel yeah. like. Yeah, I was like, that's pretty, pretty clever. Th those are the same speakers that our buddy uh, Joe Intel got a lot of feedback from when he reviewed them. If that's if right, you remember that? Yeah, he, I think he did with the three hundred ones or something like that, or or I can't remember exactly which model. But it's funny that you ask because I actually was just looking today about maybe trying to test a few sound bars just to play around with something different. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, one of the top sellers at B and H is a Bose, one of their Bose. I think it's like three ninety nine solo or thought. whatever. I may try that one, yeah, just to give it a shot. Yeah. Just see what it yeah, tests test like. them because I'm not going to put a full surround sound in my in my living room. <laughs> I'm just too I, I'm convenience over fidelity as far as home theater goes. Oh yeah, I'm I'm, I'm dude. I'm rocking my television speakers, and I, I <laughs> when I test speakers, like I'll bring them in the living room and test them out. But I always wind up just turning them off when I'm watching TV because I have to have like two different or three different remotes to change things, and I'm like the TV's fine. I'm not paying attention to the sound as much as I am, like what's going on. And as long as I can tell what they're saying, I'm happy with the television. And I've got a, a home theater upstairs, you know, if I want to mess around with that stuff, which ironically I hardly ever use. <laughs> so whatever. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting even to find out, like even if they wouldn't let you publish their measurements or whatever, I, th I think it's important and, and valuable to find out why people are liking these bows over, you know, some other speakers, you know, what yeah. frequencies are accentuated, what aren't, right. what's going on. Well, and that's why I was really interested in them because I was trying to figure out like why there was such a love hate with those particular speakers. And when I listened to them, I figured it out. It was immediate. You know, like if I'm going in with the mindset of I want to have a reference system, then, oh, my gosh, these are like the worst thing I've ever heard. But if you're going in with just a different mindset of like, I just want to hear something cool, then that's what they are. You know, and I totally get it. All right. So that's cool. Nine. Thank you very much for the super chat. And he said, hey, if a company pulls a TS using Clipple, is there a point in trying to pull it on your own dats? Um, and that's, uh, yeah, you, they I lie. would say generally, Sometimes. yes, it doesn't hurt you to do it, but do you trust, you know, if you trust the company spec at all, like ScanSpeak is a company, I probably wouldn't bother, you know, but this goes back to, it depends on how you're testing because ScanSpeak tells you how they test, you know, and if you don't test the exact same way, then you may get a different result. Do you trust, your result or do you trust the results of a company who's been engineering some of the greatest loudspeakers for the last, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 years? Where do you go with that? So I'm not really sure what the, what the real answer is there. Yeah. And I think you can get more, some valuable information from your Clipple measurement versus a DATS because a DATS is going to give you, you know, your TS parameters and things of that nature, but a Clipple will actually show you what you said, like based off excursion, mm -hmm. what's actually going on with the driver, you know, is it, right? you know, when it's going up is, you know, what's, what's actually happening, which, which is, it's, it's interesting, I think. Yeah. I want to give you linear excursion too. So like a, a point, this is how much excursion you can get one way out of the speaker before, you know, you reach a point of distortion, like either 10% or 20%, depending on which way it was tested. Mm. So that's one good reason to do it. And that's one thing I like about testing them is because you have all these different manufacturers and even some very respectable ones in the car auto community stating linear excursion. But if you know what Clipple is, then you know that linear excursion is actually an IEC standard. It's a standard. And these manufacturers know this, but they're stating linear to get by with it. And then when you test their product, it comes into like half of what they state. And then you go to them and say, well, we calculate it off of, you know, the physical is whatever the voice call plus the, the, you know, the gap height, you know, 
times 0.15 or times 1.15 to give you an extra little bit of room. And you're like, well, you know, I know that you know about Clipple and I know that you know that when you state linear, people are thinking linear in terms of Clipple. So I feel like it's very misleading. Um, but that's why I like to test them all in the same manner, because at least, you know, if I've tested it, then you can compare them within my own data set. See, that's the thing. <clears throat> I think about um, like Wilson Audio Labs, uh, Aaron, your channel. Um, the reason why these channels exist, the reason why we need these YouTube channels, the reason why we need people testing things out and, and seeing how it actually does in the real world is because these companies are unreliable. Not all of them. Mm hmm. But a non-trivial number of them are just going to put specs on a spec sheet because that's what they think they've got to put on the spec sheet to make the sale. Yeah. And that's pretty damn frustrating. Right. It'd be nice to be able to read the spec sheet and actually know what the heck's going on. Yeah. No joke. Yeah. yeah. Well, keep 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 them accountable, right? Like Absolutely. And, and trying to spread awareness. And I think that's one of the good things about what you're doing. Same with Wilson Audio Labs is spreading that awareness that – you know, just because a company says like linear excursion doesn't necessarily mean you're getting what you think you're getting. Right. Well, and th what comes into this is you have a lot of menu packagers who are ordering from, you know, build houses or whatever the case may be. And they're just going off the TS specs or the parameters that are given to them from this company. Uh, right. There's cargo companies like, like Rockville that has a, like a sticker serial number on the birth sheets, meaning, this is just kind of a mass market thing that they're sending out. They're not doing them individually for every amp. They're not burning in the amps, testing the amps. So yeah. that, that's reason enough for me to want to test them. Well, that's a cute, that's why I say like, it depends on the company. Like if it's a company that I trust, like I go yeah. back to ScanSpeak, you know, I've tested a lot of their products over the years and almost every single time, actually, I guess I will say every single time that I've tested something of theirs, either the, the lower line, like discovery to the illuminator line, it's always, almost always matched up exactly with their spec sheet. And it's like, okay, so I'm done testing ScanSpeak because I trust them, you know? Yeah. Uh, but if it's something else that I don't know about, then yeah, I'm going to test it because not only do you not necessarily know the company, you don't know their quality control, you know? Like you guys stated, I mean, they may have something specced out and it may come from an ideal, you know, golden unit, but who knows what's going on down the line and, and the quality control. Yeah, and you bring up ScanSpeak and ScanSpeak's, important because ScanSpeak makes their own drivers right uh, they right. have their own factory they can do their own quality control and what brian says hey it could be a result not necessarily of their engineering but of the build house that's making them and maybe they make changes that the company's not aware of yeah and good Aaron. and that's what I, that's kind of what i was saying with the quality control i mean you may have a spec but they may not be achieving the spec for one reason or another and that's when i get back to do i trust the company you know and there's probably only a handful of companies that i would say yeah i'm not even going to bother i trust what they state but I think everybody should own a DATS and I think everybody should take the time to measure the speaker to learn because that way, if you get a measurement that doesn't look right, then there's an opportunity for you to learn and understand. And when you dig into it, you may understand more about what the specs mean and that may translate to you building a better enclosure. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's all part of the learning process. Yeah. I've had people that have, you know, done all their measurements off of, you know, their TS parameters that were given to them, build the box, test it with DATS afterwards, the box, mm -hmm. because you can get, you know, mm -hmm. your measurement and then find out that it's not tuning correctly. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. they're wondering why. And you're like, yeah, oh, no. I just, yeah. that's why I just buy prefabs and I put every subwoofer in it. Dude, there's it's nothing wrong enough. with that. Close enough. I'd like to buy like two or three prefabs and just glue them together. So it makes them sturdier. <laughs> yeah. That's why. I mean, instead yeah. of double baffle, why not like right. double box it? Yeah. yeah. And I, I like to get the carpeted ones and then glue them with the carpet touching each other. So that way, you know, it's going to bond really well. <laughs> right. <laughs> So Jesse, uh, Jesse had a question for you, Aaron. He said, hey, has there ever been a driver that you tested that either surprised you how, how closely or good it ran or how far it diverged away from your Yeah, uh, ScanSpeak, because that's, I've been talking about <laughs> it. Like I said, the ScanSpeak, when I tested the ScanSpeak Illuminator 18WU, I think in 2011, um, the the TS parameters, I think, was spec linear excursion was like, I want to say it was plus or minus nine millimeters, I think is what it was spec'd at. And I got plus or minus 11. And then Vance Dickinson had recently tested them for voice call magazine. And I think his results showed the same thing. And I was like, well, dang, they're, they're overdoing their stuff. Um, I can't think of any right now that I've tested that I, well, audio development, I mentioned them a minute ago. Um, that I just was not impressed at all with that speaker, considering especially what you pay for it. 
Uh, but I can't think of anything else. I know no, there's been – I've probably tested over 100 drivers in the years. I just can't think of everything. Wasn't Purify one that you were impressed with? Oh, yeah. Purify, I was like, wow, these are legit. Yeah. yeah. Those are some really interesting speakers. And a lot of science goes into them. I had one of their designers on my channel talking about their – you know, how they came up with the design. And he, you know, brought out the speaker, the actual parts, the hard parts and the soft parts, and set it up on the table and was like, you know, this is where we got the magnet and – this is the actual cone and how all this stuff. And I was just like, I am, I don't know what you're talking about right now, dude, but that sounds really cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know what though? Like there's people that come on channels and stuff that talk things that we don't know about, but you can just tell how excited they get that they're really excited about oh, it. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I had a, uh, one of the designers from Clipple on my channel to talk about the near field scanner, because I, what I was going to do when I got the near field scanner, I was going to talk about it. And say, hey guys, this is what I'm doing my testing with now, and this is you know how it operates. This is the uh, the basis that it works under, you know, and the science behind it. And then I was looking through it and trying to study up on it a little bit more so I could relay that without goofing it up. And I thought, why don't I just ask Christian Bellman, you know, the designer, to come on my channel and talk about it? And he did. And we got like an hour and a half into it, and I said, well, you know, I, you probably need to be going because it's like five o'clock in, in Germany. And he's like, oh no, I'm fine. And it was on a Friday. He's like, oh, no, I'm fine. So we went another 30 minutes and I was like, well, we probably need to be going. He's like, oh, I can, you know, I'm fine. I'll keep talking about it. like he was legitimately pumped to be talking about it. You know, that was his baby. Yeah, I had um, Clement from Cartesian Speakers. I don't know if you've ever heard of these. These are these are new for the DIY, at least in, in our area. They, they're, they used to yeah. just sell to high end companies. Yeah. One of those guys, I don't know if it was somebody who works for them or somebody else had reached out to me like a couple months ago and said, hey, you need to test some of these speakers. And then. I don't think I ever got anything back from them. I said like, okay, or whatever. Anyway, yeah, yeah, I'm familiar oh, with them. Oh, that's too bad. Well, if you want to test them, let me know. I'll see if I can get a hold of Clement, who's the, the owner of the company. But okay. uh, yeah, I, th these have been really interesting to me. I, I would be really interested to see how they they Clipple test. Uh, now, he's got measurement Clipple measurements of some, but in the same instance, it's nice to get a verified third party. Right, uh, right. But I do like the fact that on their website, they show a lot of the Clipple testing of these. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I remember going to their site and being like, okay, they've actually got like real data up. That's impressive. Well, yeah, I there's think not made to do that. It, it, it would, I mean, you should be a certified third party tester. Have you ever considered that for mm, other companies? No. Like if you're talking like in terms of getting paid for it. Yeah. Yes. No, I don't want to do that. I don't want to get into. Get tied yeah, in with them. That's, that's a weird, that's a weird area for me. I really try to stay like away from, you know, having manufacturers pay me for doing anything. So like the majority of anything that I would make to support this or my channel would be like, you know, affiliate links, which I know some people are totally against affiliate links. But my thing is, hey, if you're being honest and you're telling people that you're putting an affiliate link out there, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it because they don't have to click. Right. You can always well, you, click it or Google it. You, you have to tell people when there's an affiliate link, there's an FCC regulation that right. requires yeah. it. Yeah. Um, well, I know that there are some that that don't um, like home audio speaker reviewers. They don't talk about like I always say in my video, I'm going to throw an affiliate link out there, you know, but that's how I generate, you know, the income. Because for me, YouTube ain't paying Jack. <laughs> like It's no, funny, man. too, because like I know some people will say like, oh, you got a YouTube channel. You know, that's pretty cool. You're going to quit your job soon, like joking around. But I know in the back of their head, they're thinking of these people who have like millions of viewers who are making millions of dollars. And I'm like, YouTube doesn't pay you. It, like when you do super chats, they take 30 percent or something, right? Like. Yeah, 45 more, closer to 45 yeah i mean it's ridiculous yeah. i'm like what the heck so yeah. no anyway. and that's i and i think a lot of people don't get that and, and that's the truth i mean if you found the information valuable then you should be you should want to click your link i mean that's yeah. that's why i look at it i agree yeah i mean it's that's that's the easiest thing that like if you want to help somebody out then that's to me if you're already going to buy it then just going through my link it doesn't cost you anymore you know, so that's why I always say to do that, because I, I really just don't want to get into testing for manufacturers for pay, because even if I feel like it's not going to bias me, which it might and I may not realize it, yeah. I feel like, you know, there's going to be some kind of weird stigma associated with me or them or, you know, somebody will say, well, remember that one time and then three years later, it's going to catch up with me, you know, so I just try to stay clear of that. Yeah, it's the same when you start accepting money for reviews, you know, you have to be yeah. very careful about doing that, because if you do and you're not careful, you know, companies will lock you into basically just doing an advertisement for them. They don't really care about your actual science or data behind it unless it helps right. them. 
Right. Not saying that you can't do it. I mean, Joe and Tell does a good job. of. of yeah. Yeah. That. They do. They do. good. And the, and the thing I've talked to them about it is like, they're honest, you know, like my whole thing with them is like, Hey, as long as you just tell people I have, n I don't care what anybody does if they need to make a living off of it. Just as long as you're honest about it, he's retiring. Donation. Sound <laughs> advice for high five Vegas retirement gift. Oh, geez. El Fuego. That's, that might actually hold him off for a few months. He might be all yeah. right. Yeah. It'd be good. Yeah. Taco Bell though. Thank they're getting expensive. That. I'll tell you. Yeah, but El Fuego, thank you for the thank you for the super chat, man. The ten dollars super chat for for the sound advice retirement for Hi Fi Vega. You know, talking about the fitted my, links. A hat to protect that head when he goes outside. No, man, I'm good. I can grow hair <laughs> if I want. I need I no. I need one of those. I need one of those. That's why I shaved it last <laughs> last spring. Came around, I was like, I'm just shaving it. I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. Now, if I get like a million viewers or something, it can afford some some plugs. There you go. Yeah, you guys are gonna see me rocking some plugs, but I probably can't even do it at a million. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a million. Dude, it's, it, it's crazy because subscribers don't really, the, and that's the thing that people don't understand. And we, we've talked about this before on this channel, but in general, like just like these live streams don't pay the bills, right? Like they they Absolutely don't. Like the live not. streams are they're fun. We do them for you guys. Yeah. We definitely don't do them to get paid. Um, that's just like, you'll make $5 off a live stream, maybe your 10. I mean, you're not going to make much money off the live After stream. After YouTube takes their cut, especially, right? Yeah, exactly. At least they give a cut, you know, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, none of those are, uh, are cutting in on any of the advertising. So I don't, I don't even understand why people do that. Like, that's cr like, why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Instagram stuff. Yeah. My wife's got a friend who's like an Instagram influencer or something. She's got like 10,000 yeah. followers. And I'm like, how does she, they're definitely money? getting money for, real, I'll get for, uh, posting with products definitely yeah but you oh. know like the affiliate links thing what people don't realize especially if it's like an amazon affiliate even if you're not going to buy that product click that link and it puts a cookie for 24 hours so right. if you're going to yeah. buy a refrigerator for a thousand bucks from amazon then you know, that's really helping somebody out even if you're not going to buy the product they're reviewing yeah yeah and what i tell these guys too whenever i'm buying something from amazon i always i try to go through someone's affiliate link that that has been helpful to me because it's like why not i mean i'm right. gonna be buying this stuff anyway it doesn't yeah, matter exactly. so high five exactly. vega and justin especially have gotten quite a few <laughs> from me. Are you the guy who ordered a thousand dollars with the rims off of amazon the other day <laughs> yeah. is that you or they spin well, rims <laughs> i've had some weird stuff somebody did buy a dishwasher a couple months ago and it was a it was a bosch dishwasher oh Ooh, fancy. so i got like 20 bucks off of that you know it was an expensive dishwasher i was like dang I'm, yeah the, the I'm percentages living. aren't terribly high it's not like Ooh, affiliate man. links are crazy yeah, lucrative it's, uh, it's like but, generally it's like four percent with amazon right like depending on what's the highest two category two percent is the average i think Okay. Yeah. I know it's category based and like B and H I just got hooked up with them and I think it's like 2%. So I'm like, it would be easy. It's so funny. Like if I were doing this for money, I would just go to Lowe's and get a job because they're paying 15 bucks an hour. Right. You know, oh, and I would have to sit on my computer yeah. and edit videos and all that crap all day. Like I enjoy it. I do this for the love because it's really fun. Um, and if I can get enough to help me pay off the stuff that I need to do the stuff, then that's, that's helpful. And that's kind of the thing that the goal is to make a channel that feeds itself. Uh, you know, yeah. that's the financial goal. I right, don't think yeah. anyone, yeah. anyone in our kind of sphere that we rotate in, we're, you know, a lot of us YouTubers, we know each other. Uh, there's a Facebook group that some of us are in. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, none of them are, are out there going, yeah, I'm here to go make my millions on YouTube. <laughs> it's, it's all about, we love this. We're passionate about it. We want to share it with people. And if, if we can make enough money so that it feeds itself, then we can keep doing it. And if it doesn't, yeah. we can't. That's the thing. Yeah. It's got to like, if my, if I'm coming out of my own pocket, you know, then that's when it starts, you know, which I am, but hopefully I can start paying some of that off. But it's well, especially in audio. Cause we're such a small, if you even exactly. think about it, like in car audio, there's no 1 million sub channels right now in exactly. home audio. I'm not so sure that there's very many over a million either. So here's I mean, the deal. This is, this is what we're that. saying. Aaron's audio corner bought a clipple for you guys to get accurate measurements. You can give him donations. He accepts donations. I do. He has it right there on his website. So I do go to his YouTube channel, send donations to him. Yeah. You can also do that to us too, but you can also do it to him and just, you know, help him realize that this is a good thing for the community, which I believe it is. 
Yeah. And if I you're think... not the donation type, go to the video where you review the speaker you want to buy. And if it's a good review and it did tested well and sounded well, click that affiliate link. It's not like it's going to yeah. cost anybody any money. Buy a sub zero refrigerator from Amazon. <laughs> yeah. Get you, yeah. Get you a fridge. Hey, if they have Teslas on there, go ahead and order one of those. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they're selling those yet, but yeah. No, mm, man. No. But it's fun. Like, I don't know. I, I enjoy it. It's almost OCD sometimes because last, I was it yesterday or the day before I was, you know, going back and forth with, uh, with Rob and he was messaging me or I said, are we still on for Saturday? Or I said, are we still on for Monday? And I think this was on Saturday. Right. Yeah. And as I was texting you, I was actually testing a speaker at that exact same time. <laughs> like I was setting <laughs> yeah. up the clipper to run a test on another speaker. So, <laughs> all right. So I got to ask you, is there anything that you want to test that you haven't tested yet? Um, I'm sure that there are a lot of things. <sighs> Nothing that spot. Yeah. Well, so like there's, Key Audio has a, uh, they call it a, th a Key Audio 3, and it is similar to a speaker that I've tested recently, which was the Dutch & Dutch HC, which is a cardioid speaker. So it's basically mostly front firing, um, and then it's got some rear cancellation off like, well, the Dutch & Dutch had rear cancellation off the side vent. So I think the Key has active cancellation, uh, but that's like 15K, and they are going to send it to me because I talked to one of their dealers last week. So they're going to send me a pair to test. So I would really looking forward to that. Uh, I really would love to be able to test, I'm going to say test, a, a pair of Macintosh 1.2 kilowatt amplifiers and then just lead the country with them. <laughs> yeah, you know? So here's the deal. For a lot of these, so they send them to you to review, you review them and then you send them back. Is that Yeah, that that's so most of the stuff, like especially with drivers is how that works. Um, or, you know, I contact a friend of mine who is a dealer and, you know, they say, yeah, yeah, it's fine. I'll send it to you. Um Amazon. Uh, sometimes I bought those myself just straight up and I don't send stuff back. Like I've had people say, well, why don't you just, you can buy it and return it. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. Like one, you can burn yourself. And two, that just doesn't feel right to, to buy right. something knowing that I'm going to send it right back. I just, I don't like that. No, I'm uh, with you there. That's not right at all. And if yeah, you do that no, too much, Amazon will, will kill you off your Amazon account. Yeah. Well, and one dude recently said something about um, me ordering, I can't remember the name of the company, but he was like, you can order these speakers and then test them and then send them back. And I'm like, dude, that's messed up. Like it's, and it was a, it was a small company, like probably, you know, an operation of like five people, like a family owned type company. I was like, I'm not doing that. That's, that's messed up. Uh, yeah. But I actually did work out something with B&H recently where I signed up for their affiliate account and they send you this email. It says, if you got any questions, let us know, you know, and I'm like, oh, I got questions. So um, I contacted them and told them my questions and the guy called me and we talked for a little bit. So what they've done is anything that they sell up to a certain dollar amount, they will give me to test. And then when I'm done testing it, I just send it right back. So they've covered shipping both ways. And some of the speakers that I've tested recently, that's where I've gotten them from. So it doesn't cost me anything. They send it to me and all I've got to do is throw out an affiliate link and that kind of helps them. But I was worried that that was going to, you know, cause some kind of conflict of interest. And the guy was like, yeah, if you don't like it, just say you don't like it. So the last two speakers I've tested, I'm like, I wouldn't buy this, but I'm putting an affiliate link there anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of that, well, you know, the thing is, if you don't like it, you got to say you don't like it because the last thing you want is someone to buy something based on your recommendation and then it not be a, a quality yeah, product. Exactly. Um, and if you say you don't like it and someone buys it anyway, they can't blame you for buying something that's not any good. Exactly. So I fall kind of under, I know Joe and Tell feels this way too sometimes where we say, hey, sometimes the speaker's good for the price, right? Where, right. you know, maybe it's not the greatest speaker, but you're only spending a hundred bucks. You don't know, no big yeah, deal. Yeah, exactly. So this, these are some Mookie. These are three ways. They came from Amazon. They're powered speakers, hundred dollars. So I was like, why do you need a three way for those small drivers? But whatever. But I yeah. wanted to try them out. The company sent them to me and I was flat out honest with them. I said, do you still want me to do a review on them? Because they're terrible and I don't yeah. like them at all. And I think you're going to have a really bad, you know, the video is not going to go well. And they said, do the video. And I'm like, okay, well, that's I'll cool. do the video for you. But I, you know, I, but in the same instance, I'm going to be honest with the people that sent me these, you know, because they told me I could have them. I don't know what I'm going to do with them because I don't like them at all. I don't yeah. like I wouldn't even stick them in my kid's bedroom because I don't want them to to fall in love with that type of sound. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, man. So I don't I don't know what I'm going to do with them, but they they're really harsh. I haven't even hooked up the measurement microphone to them. I need to because there's just some stuff yeah. going on so, in there. That so I, Aaron, I've got a question for you. When you're, um, when you get a set of speakers in bookshelf speakers, whatever the case may be, and you're going to set them up and measure them. 
uh, using the the Clipple or is it mm-hmm. Kipple, however it's pronounced? Clipple. What K-L, what yeah. what kind of what kind of time does it take to get it all set up to do a test? Uh, you know, your microphones and everything. How much time do you put into testing a set of speakers? All right. So let me give you the long answer for for this. Um, when I was testing speakers starting last year, I was trying to get anechoic data. And if you've, you know, when you test, most DIYers are testing quasi anechoic, which means you're gating at like three or four milliseconds. Um, and then that also means, unfortunately, that not only are you limited in, in the lower frequency resolution um, or frequency, but you're limited in resolution as well. So instead of having a data point like every 20 hertz or something like that, you've got a data point every three or every 400 hertz. And so if there's a strong mid-range resonance, you're not going to pick that up with a gated response. Unfortunately, that's just kind of the nature of the beast. So what I was doing last year was I was doing 140 tests. I would do 70 quasi anechoic uh, gated to about seven or nine milliseconds, depending on how high I could get the speaker off the ground. Um, so it would be every 10 degrees horizontally and every 10 degrees vertically going around the speaker. So I would stand it up and then I would lay it on the side. Uh, I actually went out and bought some rafters. Um, so I could put this thing on a, on a dolly type as crazy setup anyway. So I'd spin it all the way around and then I would put it on the ground and do the exact same thing. So 140 total measurements. And then I would merge all of those measurements to get me 70 individual full anechoic type measurements. Um, and that took me bare minimum of 10 hours. Sometimes it took me four days. Um, but with the clipple, the reason I got the clipple is because in about three hours, I can be done fully measured. A speaker and I can the best part is I can set it up at like nine o'clock before I go to bed, hit run, go to bed, and it's done overnight. Yeah, and that's nice. So that's it's incredible. it's all automated. It's completely automated. Now there's a lot of stuff I have to do, not a lot, but I mean I have to do the setup for it to say, okay, you know, the microphone needs to be about this far from the dut. This is my reference position, this is where the tweeter is. Um, and I have to basically build like a, a cylinder that it scans the speaker around in. Um, and then there's stuff I do after the fact, you know, I do my own compression testing and then I do some distortion testing and then some other stuff. So all in all, I'd say like a a full day for me to do everything. The hard part isn't the measurements. The hard part is getting all the data together, putting it into a format, typing it all up and then putting it on my website and then making a video about what the data means. That's yeah. I was going to say explaining what it actually means would probably be the hardest part. Yeah. And I, I kind of went cheap on my my last video, I did one Saturday with the JBL uh, 305Ps. And I said, I'm going to try doing just a live review because I don't really want to have to do an edit for this thing. And I did it and it went pretty well. So I think I may try to do that more often. It just makes life so much easier. So the Notorious RVH asked this. He said, what do y'all do with this stuff collected? So some uh, sometimes companies will send you the stuff and you keep it. Um, most of the people I review with, that's that's the way it is because the way I have it set up, at least for me is that we do garage sales on my Patreon account every once in a while. And you guys get to buy them for whatever the price you get. They're blind. They're blind. So you guys just put a blind bid in. (laughs) And then if you win it, you win it and you pay shipping and that's about it. But what do you guys do with the rest of the stuff you guys collect? Most of it, I give away to people, (laughs) just people around here. If you, Oh, you need a sub. Yeah, I got a sub. Let's throw it in there. (laughs) Throw an app in there. My collection hasn't gotten that big yet. It's mostly just props in the background of videos. That's mostly what I'm doing with it. Aaron, you know, what about you? Do you have any? Um, I, 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 give it sure away. You... I don't keep yeah. anything. I, I will give it away either through my Facebook group page or if there's somebody I know that can use them, I'll just give them to them. Um, most of the stuff, I'll ask them if they want me to send it back. And, and if they don't, then that's what I just give it away. Because I have my own reasons, but one of them is I just, I don't need stuff. I've got, I don't, I don't have room for stuff. You know, yeah. so I just get rid of it. I got that bug a while back. Like, I don't want stuff laying. I've already, I've always got too much stuff laying around here. Yeah. yeah. And I'd re- I'd rather just, you know, if I'm going to, even if I'm going to buy something that I don't plan on using, I'm just going to enjoy it for a little while and then I'll just either sell it on. Yeah. Or, or, or just. That's what I've always on. done. I've yeah. always sold like in car audio. Like every time I wanted to rebuild my car, it was always like, I'm just going to sell whatever I had to fund the new thing because I don't need stuff just sitting around. And I, and I can't afford you know, to pay full price if I'm going to have to keep something too. So, yeah, no kidding. Now, I completely agree. Get it in someone's hands that are going to use it. And I think that's the most important thing. I, I, I used to be, you know, I've mentioned this many times. I used to be like a therapist or a counselor, whatever you want to call it before, before I, I moved to Tennessee. And um, one of the things they'll tell you in there is, is make them pay for it. Cause if you don't make them pay for it, even just a little amount, they don't use it. 
And it's, huh. it, there's a, there's an interesting point to that, that like, you know, when you just give someone something, they don't appreciate it as much as when they paid for it. That's interesting. Yeah. And I just think like, you, I you're shaking like your head. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like you have a degree in behavioral economics. That's well, part of it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Aaron, what were you going to say, man? I'm sorry, we cut you off. Yeah, we, oh, no, we got to end this. I think I just blanked out anyway. I just I tend well, to do that. Is there anything you, you want to pimp out, Aaron, before we close this out? Myself? We're at our hour, yeah. All right, well, how much do you charge an hour? Well, I don't That's know. That's important. It, let me change it to the red light special, and we'll see what <laughs> I can do. Well, I, well, we should probably talk to your wife. I'm sure she sets the rates for this. No, if, if it's up to her, man, she's probably just giving me away. <laughs> 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 He's like, just leave a couple with me so I can go, I can sell it. It's Dude, fun. guys, we, I've, I, I don't know about you guys, but I've really appreciated having. Aaron on the channel. He seems like a really awesome dude. I've never met Aaron in real life, but on here just seems really cool and chill. Check out his channel. Make sure to subscribe to it um, if you haven't already. And and take a look at it. I think you're going to like it. And if you appreciate the content he puts out, really consider doing a donation for him because I think that's a great way to do it. Or, you know, click on someone's affiliate link and, and buy from, you know, whoever you think has helped you out the most. Yeah. Don't make sure you buy that Tesla. Right. <laughs> I'll try yeah, to watch the subwoofer, the budget subwoofer review is still to this day yeah. my favorite Aaron's audio corner video. Yes, I like that one. too. And the, those mono price did pretty well. I was um, impressed with those. Yeah. The um, uh, I'm actually surprised at that because I want I go back and watch that video like and, and I'm like, oh my god, this is terrible. But like <laughs> that, like everybody seems to really appreciate because I guess it just happened to hit on the right subject matter, you know. So I'm planning on doing yeah. the same thing, but for 12s. The problem right now is finding companies that have the, their 12 inch budget subwoofers in stock. So I've got a big F12 that I ordered and I'm going to have to test all these at separate times, unfortunately. Yeah. So I, I'm, I've got that one, but then I'm waiting for Dayton to get their stuff back in stock and then some other companies to get their stuff back in stock. It's just, it's crazy, man. So we'll see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be really surprised in how the big F12 does because a lot of people swear by that. Well, that's, that's why I want to test it because everybody was saying, test that one, test that one. And I'm like, all right. Because I, I used to have a big, like my first house in 2007, I had a big piece of crap, but it was it was awesome for what it was. But what, relative what to what I have now, twelve, huh? What's the twelve cost? Uh, somewhere in the two fifty ballpark. So it might actually be able to play under forty hertz. Yeah, it might. It's, it hopefully it we'll won't see. be just a mid bass module. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's a lot there. Well, guys, we should end because we do have the after show for the patrons. So patrons, make sure you stay for the after show. We'll be on in about ten minutes or so. We're gonna all take a break, guys. Anything you want to say before we we head out? Otherwise, I'm gonna end it. Yeah, I want to yeah. say thank you to Aaron for coming on. Really enjoyed it. And yes. believe it or not, Aaron is this cool of a guy in real life. So I could vouch for him. He's lying. No, I, I will say I appreciate you guys inviting me on. When Rob told me the, uh, you guys had asked, I was like, well, that's sweet. So, heck, yeah, like DIY audio dudes, that's that's where I started, man. That's my roots. So I'm absolutely there. Thanks. All we right. appreciate it. Yeah, man. Appreciate it. All right, it. guys. We're out. Peace. <laughs>